Hello everyone and welcome to another Cutrate Commander Precon Upgrade Guide, the series where we take a look at Precon decks and bring them up to Cutrate standards. My name is Grazit, and today we'll be looking at the Fey Dominion Precon from Wilds of Eldraine and its face commander, Tegwil Duke of Splendor, which we'll be bringing up from its roughly $40 price point to an increased budget of $75 after upgrades. But before we continue, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content and would like me to continue making more videos like this in the future. And if you're feeling particularly generous, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description to keep me caffeinated as I work on more of these builds, or use our newly acquired affiliate link with Game Nerds in the description below if you're looking to purchase sealed MTG product, singles, accessories, or any of their wide selection of other TCGs and board games at the lowest prices around while helping out the channel as you do so. Also, be sure to stick around until the end of the video to see which Precon upgrade we'll be covering next. So, with that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the commander and playstyle. Tegwil Duke of Splendor is a 2-3 fairy noble that costs 1 in Demir, has flying and death touch, and the following abilities. Firstly, other fairies we control gain plus 1 plus 1, and secondly, whenever another fairy we control dies, we draw a card and lose 1 life. Breaking down his core stats, Tegwil is sporting a relatively low CMC, a slightly below average stat block for his cost, which is made up for by his built-in flying and death touch to make him tricky to block, and possesses a pair of abilities that care about fairies by empowering them while they're alive, and turning them into card advantage when they ultimately meet their demise. Taking a closer look at his first ability, it simply makes our commander a typical lord for his tribe, which considering almost every single fairy and fairy token has access to flying makes this especially dangerous against decks that aren't equipped to handle large amounts of evasive threats, thereby incentivizing us to flood the board with tribe members to get as much value out of this ability as possible. Then his second ability helps protect us against overcommitting to the board with our fairies by turning every token and non-token fairy we control into card advantage as they get picked off by removal or wipes, allowing us to build up our boards with impunity with huge amounts of evasive tribal bodies and force our opponents to either take the damage or deal with them and net us card advantage instead. It should be noted that this is not a May trigger, however, making the life loss it incurs a potential problem if we lose too much of our board state, so best keep that in mind once our life totals start falling to concerning levels. So, as we can see based on his abilities, Tegwil is clearly a fairy tribal commander, aiming to empower his tribe while they're in play and to generate value off of them as they die off, and as expected, the base build does an admirable job at reflecting this playstyle, including a solid number of both new and old fairies to be empowered by him, a decent amount of fairy token creation to grow our board with even more tribal bodies, and plenty of tribal support cards to further empower and generate value off of them, as well as sporting a flash sub-theme that takes advantage of all the flash speed fairies and instants the base build has at its disposal to generate even more value. But as usual, there's always room for improvement. For example, the fairy count in this build is somewhat low for a tribal deck, so we'll be padding those numbers with some additional specimens to take advantage of our commander's ability to empower and to generate value off of them. Then from there, we'll be refining the build's tribal token creation even further to help us build up our board even faster, supplementing our tribal payoffs to empower and generate value off our fairies even more, and adding in some additional ways to empower our fairies that takes advantage of them all being flyers to allow them to punch well above their weight, ensuring that our fey army will have no issues dominating the skies and showing the mortal races the power of the fey world. So let us make our way to Eldraine and to the Fey Court, where Talion, the Lord of the Fey, resides, and, beneath them, their dukes and duchesses, fellow Fey nobles sworn to exert their lord's will for the good of their people and the realm. It is here that we'll find Tegwil, a fairy whose beauty is only rivaled by his own skill with glamours, dutifully serving his lord as one of their most trusted vassals. 
tasked by Talion to protect the mortal races against the living nightmares plaguing the land, Tegwil has assembled an army of the most powerful Fey under his command to execute his lord's orders, leading them from the front as a magnificent beacon of elegance and power, banishing the living nightmares back to the realm of dreams with the grace and poise only achievable by a fairy noble such as himself. So, now that we have a better understanding of the commander and playstyle, let's take a look at the cards we'll be keeping from the base build. Starting off with the creatures that made the cut from the core build, it should come as no surprise that we'll be hanging on to the majority of the creature base, as the base build has some superb tribe members built into it already to serve as a solid foundation for us to build upon. As such, we'll be holding on to the low-cost fairies, Fairy Seer and Cloud of Fairies, both of which hit the board quickly and either provide card selection to help smooth out our draws, or are effectively free to cast to free up our mana for other spells, the adventuring hypnotic sprite keeping its spot as both an instance to disrupt our opponent's casting while proccing our flash speed matters payoffs, and a cheap tribal body to benefit from and proc our tribal payoffs, and the flash speed quickling will retain its position as a way for us to protect our key fairies at instant speed on a decent sized body for the cost, as will the fairy payoff Obira Dreaming Duelist, who we can also flash in and weaponizes all our fairies by turning them into AoE life loss as they come in to play, which can close out games very quickly when combined with our token creation. Then staying on the tribal payoff game plan for a moment, the new Fairy Blade Master makes the grade by being an ever-growing tribal threat that, when it's eventually removed, inflicts a hefty amount of life drain to the table on top of cantripping thanks to our commander. Nettling Nuisance stays in as a decent statted evasive body that spreads even more damage around the table via gifting our opponents extra bodies that they have to use against each other, and Scion of Una will keep its spot as both another lord to work alongside our commander as well as a means to provide AoE targeting protection for our entire tribe to ensure they stick around for longer, which we can even flash out to surprise our opponents with. And of course, the new Archmage of Echoes and Shadow Puppeteers will be keeping their positions as well, with the former being a tribal reflections of Lechara on legs to allow us to double up on all our fairies as we cast them for even more board presence and value, while the latter serves as a back-breaking tribal finisher that turns all our low base power and toughness fairies into 4-4s that keep their fairy typing, enabling them to hit like a ton of bricks while still proccing and benefiting from our tribal payoffs to quickly close out games. And while not a proper tribal payoff per se, Glenelendra Liege will be staying in this category too as a pseudo-tribal lord that still empowers our tribe members thanks to their colors, that, thanks to being a flying fairy itself, still takes full advantage of the build's tribal and flying payoffs. Then switching gears from Fairy Empowering to Fairy Creation, both Fairy Formation and Una Queen of the Fae will maintain their spots as repeatable sources of tribal token creation, with the former being a serviceable mana sink to draw us cards and create tribal bodies, while the latter forgoes the card advantage to potentially create many more tokens by milling our opponents instead. And that's on top of both of them being decent sized evasive beat sticks for us to swing in with to keep the pressure up. We then also have a Layla Cunning Conqueror staying in as yet another source of tribal token creation that procs off our flash speed spells, on top of turning our fairies into pseudo removal via granting them on damage go to force our opponents to attack each other while we build up our board state, and Namira soon as Trickster hanging on to his spot too as another flash speed spells matter payoff that turns the spells we cast on our opponents turns into cantrips and card selection, allowing us to dig deeper and deeper into our deck for more resources as we cast them. The reprint Brazen Borrower and the new Malleable Imposter will then also be staying in as more flash speed spells to enable these payoffs, the former being both an instant and a flash speed creature to enable our flash payoffs twice on a decently statted tribal body that also bounces our opponent's permanence, and the latter being a flash speed clone, significantly shortening the window that our opponents have to react to it as it gives us a copy of the most dangerous creature at the table, while also keeping its very subtype and flying to continue proccing and benefiting from all our payoffs. 
And then to wrap up the remainder of our held over fairies, both of the persisting fairies, Glenelendra Archmage and Puppeteer Cleek, hang on to their spots thanks to triggering our commander's draw twice on a single body. On top of providing very solid spell disruption and a temporary reanimation, Soar of Temptation makes the grade as a tribal theft effect that at least replaces itself upon destruction thanks to our commander. Halo Forger maintains its position as a way for us to recur any instant or sorcery from any graveyard, which is superb at reusing either our or our opponent's removal to get rid of threats. And, of course, the legend Rankle Master of Pranks will be staying in thanks to nearly all his on-attack triggers being beneficial to us. From his AoE Edict letting us sack tokens to generate card advantage through our commander, his symmetrical draw netting us card advantage while further softening up our opponent's life totals, and even his AoE Discard being serviceable if we want to deny our opponent's resources while we generate card advantage through other means. Then proceeding to our retained instance, we'll mainly be focusing on keeping the most efficient removal spells included in the base build so we can disrupt our opponent's plays as best we can while we build up our board with tribe members. With Arcane Denial and Spell Stutter both staying in as efficient sources of spell disruption to prevent our opponents from comboing off or blowing out our hard-earned board states, and Reality Shift holding on to its spot as a cheap source of non-destruction removal with relatively little downside to deal with otherwise problematic creatures. And then as our only non-removal instant carryover, we have Keep Watch which serves as a decent way for us to reload our hands in this build, considering how easily we can attack in with multiple evasive bodies, or, on the flip side, we can instead use it to generate a lot of value off an opponent's attack if they decide to alpha strike into us or another opponent. Then moving on to our kept sorceries, we'll be primarily padding our core stats in this category by hanging on to the board wipes Kindred Dominance and Tegwill Scouring, the former being an excellent one-sided wipe for us to ensure that our fairies stay alive while we level our opponent's boards, and the latter serving as a more traditional wipe that does blow out our board but can easily be cast at flash speed to catch our opponents off guard, and even gives us a few tribal bodies as well so we're left with at least some board presence after the dust settles as well as the tribal draw spell Distant Melody, which is yet another solid source of card advantage that makes full use out of our large amount of tribal bodies and tribal token creation to completely replenish our hands for relatively little mana. And then reaching our enchantment carryovers, both entrants included in the base build, Reconnaissance Mission and Reflections of Lejara, will be holding on to their spots in the final build as well with the former being an excellent source of repeatable card advantage that our flying creature base can easily proc over and over again, and the latter being an excellent tribal payoff that allows our boards to go even wider as we double up on our best fairies, or at least nets us a free draw off Tegwill if we copy and sack a legendary fairy. Then with our enchantments covered, it's time to move on to our retained artifacts, which will consist of ramp sources all the way down to help us speed up and or fix our mana base. With its first wave of members being the Mana Rocks Soul Ring, Arcane Signet, Demir Signet, Felwar Stone, Mind Stone, and a Talisman of Dominance, as well as the Land Ramp Sourced Wayfarer's Bubble, all of which serve as cheap sources of ramp to help us build up our mana base in the early game. And then as our last two mana rocks and artifacts, we'll be hanging on to Midnight Clock as a blue mana rock that doubles as a slow source of card advantage, enabling us to play aggressively in the early game as we wait for its wheel effect to proc to replenish our hands, and Misleading Signpost, another blue rock that this time serves as a flash speed way for us to redirect any attack allowing us to use it defensively to protect ourselves against otherwise game-ending alpha strikes, or offensively by redirecting an opponent's questionable attack to a more deserving target, all while proccing our flash speed payoffs. And finally, reaching our retained land base, we'll be holding on to the Mana Lands Command Tower, which taps for any of our colors without sacrificing speed, Exotic Orchard as another untapped land that should generally be able to tap for any of our mana off our opponent's lands, the Tainted Land Tainted Isle, which also comes into play untapped and can easily tap for both our colors thanks to our decent number of swamps, the Reveal Land Choked Estuary, the Battle Land Sunken Hollow, and the Tribal Land Secluded Glen, all of which provide even more fixing and can generally come into play untapped thanks to their easy to proc conditions, 
The Filterland Darkwater Catacombs to provide even more fixing. Path of Ancestry, which serves as a tribal-focused land that may be slow, but does provide continual card selection throughout the game as we cast our tribe members to improve consistency. And Myriad Landscape, which serves as one last piece of ramp to help us fix and speed up our mana base even further. Then for our kept utility lands, Bajugabog will of course be keeping its spot as a staple source of graveyard hate to help us combat against graveyard-focused builds, as will the Manland Fairy Conclave, whose ability to cheaply turn into an evasive tribal body can give us that extra bit of reach we need to help close out games, especially when empowered by our commander and other payoffs. And lastly, we'll be keeping the 13 islands and 12 swamps included in the base build as our basics to round out our mana base. That leaves us with a final tally of 77 cards including basic lands we'll be keeping from the base build, leaving us with 23 cards to replace, which isn't too many all things considered and thus frees up our budget to add in some pricier options to the build. So, now that we've covered all the cards that made the cut from the core build, let's move on to our upgrades. As usual, we'll be kicking off our upgrades with the new creature additions, where we'll be swapping out some of the base build's less powerful fairies and instants in favor of a new wave of more powerful tribe members for Tegwill to empower. But first, we'll be cutting the only non-fairy included in the base build, Holebreaker Horror, which is a flash speed payoff but falls short in this build due to not proccing or benefiting from any of our tribal or flying payoffs, so we'll be replacing it with a much better fitting Talion the Kindly Lord, who does both those things and is an excellent source of repeatable card draw and damage, provided we pick two or three for their ability to draw cards off our opponents and burn them as they play those CMC spells and or those power and tough creatures. Then moving on to our fairy swaps proper, we'll start off by trading out Spell Scorn Coven, whose adventure-based remand and ETB discard are just okay spell and hand disruption, for fairy artisans, who for the same cost allow us to copy all our opponent's creatures' ETB triggers from that point forward, and net us a free body per turn on top of that to do so as we see fit for considerably more value. Mocking Sprite's two spell-focused cost reduction will lose its spot to Talion's Messenger, whose tribal-focused card selection and plus one plus one counter distribution fits much better in our Flying Fairy game plan, and a Nightmare Sprite's middling on attack card selection getting axed in favor of Una's Black Guard, who can grow our considerable amount of rogue fairies with counters and then weaponizes both those and our other counter-laden fairies by turning them into repeatable hand disruption to deny our opponents resources. Then continuing our tribe member exchange, the flash payoff Blightwing Bandit, whose enemy-focused spell theft will find a much better home in a theft-dedicated build, will be benched to make room for Fairy Mastermind, who's a much easier to proc source of repeatable card advantage as our opponents draw cards, on top of being a cheap flash speed and tribal body to proc and benefit from all our payoffs, and the somewhat less than reliable Picklock Prankster, whose self-mill adventure is a bit too risky for us to use in this build lest we hit some of our powerful enchantments and artifacts that we can't get back, being replaced with the much safer Pestermite, who instead is a proper flash speed tribal body and whose ETB tap down and more offensive stat block are a better fit for our more aggressive evasive playstyle. Then with our existing fairies refined, we'll then proceed to kicking out some of the core build's less impressive flash speed spells to make room for some more, still flash speed, tribal bodies. With the cantrip opt being exchanged out for Fairy Harbinger, who serves as a tribal tutor for us to bring whatever fairy we may need right to the top of our deck to draw into to improve consistency. The build's other cantrip, Consider, being shelved for Fairy Vandal, which is another cheap tribal body that can grow slowly over time to be become a deadlier and deadlier evasive threat, the free but ultimately unnecessary bounce spell Snap losing its spot to Spell Stutter Sprite, which is a much more in flavor source of disruption for our opponent's spells that also leaves behind a flying tribal body to proc and be empowered by our payoffs, the mediocre cantrip bounce spell Repulse being benched in favor of Vendillion Clique, which is a decent flash speed source of hand disruption to counter our opponent's tutor effects, and another decent sized evasive body for the cost, and the serviceable draw source Factor Fiction being pushed out in favor of the very nasty Mistbind Clique, 
which effectively shuts down an opponent's casting for an entire turn when we flash it in on their upkeep, on top of it being one of our bigger tribe members to keep the evasive damage coming. And then as our final new creature addition, we'll be cutting the quote-unquote free card selection and graveyard setup Frantic Search provides, so we can slot in Sprite Noble in its place, which is a solid Flying Matters payoff that helps empower our wide tribal board states even further to help push for lethal. Then with our creature upgrades covered, it's time to move on to our new instant additions, which this time will consist of removal all the way down, with the generic and limited removal spell Reckless Spite being removed in favor of the more on-theme Fairy Fencing, which serves as a decent non-destruction removal spell that can usually deal with up to mid-sized creatures for only a single mana and we can scale up as necessary, the Bounce and Self-Bounce spell run away together, being exchanged for the more on-brand Bounce spell stolen by the Fae, which can still send creatures back to hand and then leaves behind a throng of evasive tribal bodies to proc and be empowered by all our payoffs, and the interesting but somewhat out-of-place token-creating theoretical duplication being shelved to make room for the more generically good counter spell, giving us one last means to efficiently disrupt our opponent's casting to ensure that our horde of fairies can swarm them without fear of getting blown out. Then making our way to our sorcery upgrades, the only change we'll be making here will be swapping out the much too awkward to use board wipe Nightmare Unmaking for the more fairy tribal oriented sorcery Notorious Throng, which can not only create a staggering amount of tribal tokens for us to build up our board state after we swing in, but will also, more often than not, thanks to our decent amount of fairy rogues, net us an extra turn as well allowing us to use the swarm of fairies we just created alongside our existing ones to crack in again before our opponents can react to quickly close out games. Our enchantment upgrades are then up next, in which we'll be adding a fresh wave of pieces that will empower and take advantage of our evasive and tribal game plan. With the two Delve Dependents draw spell Dig Through Time being removed in favor of Bident of Thassa, which provides better repeatable card advantage that makes use of our entirely evasive tribe, and whose forced attack can be used to break otherwise stalled board states, the two conditional reanimation and attack redirection provided by Thrilling Encore and Illusionist's Gambit being sidelined to make room for the background's Feywild Visitor and Haunted One, the former helping us build up our board with three additional tribal bodies a turn as our evasive fairies get in for damage, while the latter powers up those fairies to get in for even more damage and brings them back even stronger if they're blocked and killed. And lastly, the bit too situational wipe, perplexing test, and the scry land temple of deceit lose their spots to gravitational shift and favorable winds, both of whom elevate our flying creature base to even greater heights by pumping their stats, with the former also crippling all the non-flyers at the table to prevent them from dealing as much damage to us as we continually swing out turn after turn. And finally, reaching our newly added artifacts and the last two new additions to the build, we'll be trading out the subpar bounce land Demir Aqueduct and the outright terrible land Temple of the False God for the Mana Rocks, Thought Vessel, and Decanter of Endless Water, each of which will beef up our mana base a bit more for added consistency, and also remove our maximum hand size limit to ensure that our various continual draw sources don't end up overdrawing us. So, now that we've covered all 23 cards that we've upgraded from the core build, let's take a look at the breakdown for this precon upgrade. This deck currently has 35 creatures including our commander, 7 instants, 4 sorceries, 6 enchantments, 12 artifacts, 0 planeswalkers, and 36 lands. Looking at the stats that matter to our game plan, we have 35 fairies, 10 cards that create fairy tokens, 19 cards that care about fairies, 35 cards with flying, 4 cards that care about creatures with flying, 22 cards that can be cast at flash speed, and 2 cards that care about spells being cast at flash speed, giving us a very solid tribal game plan that leans both into the tribal and flying nature of our tribe to empower and generate value off of it, while also having a decent flash speed sub-theme to consistently make us dangerous even outside of our turns. Then for general deck stats, we have 12 ramp sources, 11 card draw sources, 11 targeted removal sources, and 2 board wipes giving us a pretty by the number spread of core stats without any outliers. Looking at our mana curve, we have 4 1-drops, 22 drops, 
16 3 drops, 14 4 drops, 6 5 drops, 2 6 drops, and 2 7 drops. Leaving us with a relatively low curve that wants to drop tribal bodies and ways to generate tribal tokens onto the battlefield as quickly as possible, followed by our commander and other payoffs to empower and generate value off of our board, and then continue to pressure our opponents with our huge number of evasive bodies until they eventually succumb to our aerial supremacy. The final price of this build then comes out to be $74.58 after upgrades. This price does not include tax or shipping and assumes that the price you paid for the precon was $40. The price of the cards was calculated by using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording. Now, for side grades, we can consider exchanging out Sprite Noble for Fairy Swarm if we'd rather have one gigantic evasive tribal body to swing in with over empowering our wide evasive tribal boards, and Thought Vessel can be replaced with Likeness Looter to give us another tribal body with repeatable card selection and clone effect at the cost of slowing down our ramp and potentially suffering from overdrawing more frequently. Then for further upgrades, Nettling Nuisance can be cut in favor of Raise the Palisade to give us access to another one-sided wipe to help us retake control of the board without sacrificing our own. Keep Watch can be traded out for Kindred Discovery as yet another superb piece of repeatable draw that goes perfectly with our tribal and evasive game plan, though we may want to hold off on buying it until the reprint releases to see if it comes down further in price. And Pestermite can be traded out for Bitter Blossom as an exceptional piece of cheap fairy token creation to help us continually build up our board with tribal bodies throughout the course of the game. Though, quite appropriately based on its name, the price of adding this one to our build may be a bitter pill to swallow. Thanks everyone for sticking around until the end of the video. So, with the Fairy Dominion precon covered, we'll proceed to cover the Virtue and Valor precon and its face commander, Elevir of the Wild Court, next week. So stay tuned for a Roll and Aura themed build featuring her coming soon. And lastly, before we close out, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already, as this channel can't continue to grow without your support. And if you're feeling particularly generous, feel free to keep me caffeinated via buying me a coffee at the link in the description, or alternatively, use our Game Nerds affiliate link in the description if you're looking to purchase sealed MTG product, accessories, board games, or any of their other wide selection of products at low prices that include free shipping for orders over $75, and a rewards program that builds up store credit over time as you make your purchases. And if any of you would like to support the channel in a different way, feel free to check out the other deck techs floating around my head if you'd like to see the latest builds, or click on the link above for a playlist of all the Cutrate Commander episodes I've made so far. And with that, have a good one folks, and stay safe.